So the outline uh, of my presentation is that I will start uh, by giving some background, my own background, obviously, on the Troika programs, because I think it's very hard to understand the Troika programs if we don't put them in, uh, in, in, in a context. So I will try to, to look at some of the special features of uh, Troika programs, and then I, I will uh, look at whether uh, and how can we judge whether Troika programs uh, have been uh, successful. Uh, is it simply enough to say, you know, you have exited, therefore it's successful? Uh, is that the, the measure? Are, are there other measures? Then I will be talking about exiting, and then I will talk a bit in, at the end of sort of life beyond uh, exit, uh, because I think exit may not be the end of uh, the way one should look at some of the, uh, of the issues. Now, let me start by uh, the uh, special features uh, of uh, Troika programs. Uh, I think what one has to uh, appreciate is that uh, in uh, the years uh, that follow entry into the uh, euro area, uh, in a number of countries, uh, there were very large uh, imbalances uh, that uh, accumulated. And the result of those imbalances is that I'm going to be looking at sort of stocks and stocks both of, uh, this is net uh, international investment position, and then I'll be looking at uh, public debt. But what I'm going to do here is look at the euro area countries, which are in, in orange here, and compare them to other countries, actually to all of countries that had IMF programs in the period from 93 to 2012. So in those 20 years, look at all the IMF programs, and this is what I'm I'm judging how special are the euro area countries that went into Troika programs, including the IMF, how special was there, was the situation compared to a typical IMF program. And here what I want to show essentially is to say that the imbalances were much bigger. And here I'm looking at the external uh, imbalance and I'm giving here uh, three periods, T minus five, T and T plus five. T is the year when the program started. So it's not a year, it's the initial year of the, of the program. And what you see in red here, you have the typical, the average uh, IMF program. And in orange, you have the euro area. In green here, you have the, the countries in the Asian crisis. Uh, sort of the external imbalance uh, was bigger, much bigger than the typical IMF program, was even bigger than the, in, the, in, the Asian, uh, in the Asian crisis. If you look in terms of the public debts, uh, you get something uh, of the same nature. What you have on the left, again, is the euro area compared to, to comparators. I am all the IMF, it has Asian crisis, it has Latin American. And then on the right, you have the three program countries, uh, Greece, uh, Ireland, and Portugal. So if you look again at T, at your T, which is in the middle here, right, this part here, at T, the year when the program started, public debt levels in the program countries on average was far, far bigger than it is uh, uh, in almost double, actually, uh, than in a typical IMF program. And it's certainly bigger than it was in Latin America or in, it was in the Asian crisis. Okay? And then I showed there on the, on, on the right part, on the right panel, the differences between Ireland, Portugal, and, uh, and, uh, and Greece. But I think what I want you to remember from this is that whatever indicator you would look at you would see that in the euro area, by the time the countries get into the crisis, they had accumulated a huge amount of imbalances. Okay? So whether you want to look in terms of, of flows, uh, of current account deficit or, 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 or public deficit, or you want to look in terms of stocks, as I did here in terms of public debt, in terms of net international investment position, you see this. So huge accumulation. So I think this is, this is a, a, an important factor. Okay. So it's not your usual crisis uh, that the uh, IMF had to deal with. Now, I think that the two features is both the fact the way the euro area worked, and in the sense there was no indicator of crisis. Crisis went until very far. And in a sense, the euro area allowed the buildup of, uh, of those imbalances. But then when the crisis starts, we don't have the proper uh, institutional uh, framework to deal with the crisis. So there is also a delay before one gets help 
from the IMF, from the Troika in dealing with the crisis. So it's both that huge accumulation, but then when the crisis starts, there is a fairly large lag from the time the crisis starts to the time when T starts, when the program starts. Okay? And those are the, two, uh, the, those are the two features. Now, the result of that is that the um, Troika programs, they are far bigger than anything we have ever seen uh, in, a, in a IMF, uh, in a IMF uh, context. And here I'm looking at, again, all IMF is on, the, is on the very left here, all IMF program. You see that on average for all IMF program in the period 93 to 2012, uh, we are talking about 3 to 4 percent of GDP. This is the size of an IMF program, of GDP of the country, of the crisis country. On average for the euro area, it, it's 18 percent. And this is only the IMF part. This is not the Troika program. This is the portion financed by the IMF, let's say roughly one third. Okay? So even the IMF part is so much bigger than anything we have seen in, in general. Okay? So again, on the very far left here, all IMF. Latin American uh, average for the Latin American crisis country, you're talking about 6% of GDP. And in the Asian crisis, roughly 3%. So here, the IMF portion of the Troika program itself, on average, for those three countries is 18%. And you have to multiply that roughly by, by three, since the IMF typically only finance a third of the, uh, of, of the program. And here, what I'm showing, as a share of GDP, the different colors is who finances what. Okay, don't pay attention much to, to, the, to the colors. I'm looking here for Greece, Cyprus, Ireland, and Portugal. What is the size of the Troika program? Including the IMF, but not the full program, as a share of GDP. You see for Greece, the two programs, you are over 100% of GDP. Uh, for, for Cyprus, uh, you're coming near to uh, 60%. Ireland is about 50%, five zero, And uh, Portugal is actually the smallest but it's well over 40%. Okay? So this is not the total program, of which the blue part is the IMF finance part. On, on the most left here, the blue part is the portion finance. So this would add up to the 18% on, on average. Okay? So they are very, very big programs, exceptionally big programs. We have never had programs of that sort. And again, you have to keep the, why it happened is because of those imbalances that had built and because also we are late in dealing with the problem. Uh, difficulty of agreeing or recognizing the problem, both, I think, problem of intellectual recognition, what is the issue here, and then not having the proper uh, institutional framework uh, to deal with uh, the, uh, the, the, the emergency that, that had built up. Now, another special feature, obviously, is that contrary to an IMF program where, where countries have an exchange rate to make the adjustment here, countries inside the euro area, they don't have an exchange rate uh, instrument to regain quickly competitiveness. And uh, the next factor, uh, which I think is important, uh, is the fact that we have seen adjustment taking place, and certainly in Ireland, uh, maybe in particular, uh, adjustment has taken place, and I think and in Greece, actually, in Portugal, uh, as we will see in, in a moment, the current account, uh, they have adjusted, but they have adjusted in a very asymmetric manner. Uh, most of the burden has been on the side of the, uh, the countries that were indebted, not so much on the, on the, on the creditor, uh, on the creditor uh, side. Now, something I think you know uh, well, uh, I suppose. Uh, I don't need to, uh, to paint a long picture. No. What I want to do here, it's a picture that I actually very much like and that, that I constructed, and I will show you this picture in two parts. What I'm showing here is the euro area divided in two groups of countries, the core countries and the peripheral countries. The peripheral countries here is, includes uh, certainly Ireland, Portugal, Greece, but it has also Spain, Spain and Italy. Okay? Those are the five uh, thank you, five peripheral countries, and then they are the core countries. Now, this is the current account. Uh, this is the current account of the euro area, but divided into those two groups of countries. Uh, in blue, you have the core countries. It's DM is the old DM zone countries. Okay? And in red, you have the GIPS. So Greece, Ireland, Italy, Portugal, and Spain. 
Now, what I, what I want to, what is the black line here? The black line is the start of the, of the euro. And I can assure you, and I, I'm not doing it here, but I can assure you that if I had started the graph here, not in 91, so here it goes from 91 to 2000, 2008, okay, with in the middle, sort of the start of the euro in 99, I can assure you that if you, I had shown you the, the figure that starts in 1961, exactly the same figure, you would see what you get in the period before the euro. That is, the blue line and the red line, they move pretty much together. Okay? There is not a behavior, a historical behavior, in a sense, of the, um, of the peripheral countries versus the core countries in terms of the current account. They move fairly much together. You do see once in a while, as you see here, this is the crisis in the early 90s. Remember when Italy and some countries leave the uh, ER, ERM, okay, the exchange rate regime. So there is, just after the start of free capital movement, there is the, uh, there is the crisis. And there had been just before that a buildup of current account deficit. But look at what is the current account deficit of this aggregate. It's uh, between 2 and 3%. Okay? And you had once in a while problems of that sort, but then what you have is that exchange rate crisis, a typical exchange rate crisis, and there is a realignment, a readjustment. So there is a bit of movement, there was a bit more of movement of the peripheral countries than you get at the core, although they hover around, uh, they hover around sort of more or less zero. So they, they are not chronic current account surplus for the DM zone or current account deficit for the peripheral countries. Okay? You can't sort of uh, say, oh, one group of countries is very different from the other in terms of their current account behavior. But then look at what happens after the euro is created. You see this huge divergence. And not only you see this huge divergence, but you see indeed this huge imbalance that is being created in the, by, by the system and in the GIPS. And for the group as a whole, and it's an average. Okay? Behind that, there are obviously some countries that have far bigger deficit, Italy, which is uh, far smaller, uh, smaller deficit, but you see that at the uh, tipping point, 2007-2008, uh, sort of at when you have the, 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 the big buildup before the, uh, the financial crisis and things start to turn around, uh, we get there to uh, a current account deficit on average of about 7%. So far bigger than one, one has ever seen. If you, as I say, again, if you go back to this figure from 61, you would not see anything of that sort. Okay? You can see that it is really change. It's a change of regime uh, after the entry into the euro. The same thing for the blue line. It never went as high as the four percent here on average. And again, we know that there are different behavior Germany and other <laughs> countries. But both the blue line and the red line, that is sort of a bit mirror image here, you never had that before. So one has to ascribe that indeed to the way the the euro uh, the euro worked. Now. Uh, then look at what happens in the period since the, since the crisis. Now, you see that uh, in 2007, 2008, the current account deficit in the uh, Gibbs countries was very high, but the adjustment takes place extremely fast. Okay? But there's no adjustment on, on the blue line. So this is the asymmetric uh, adjustment that I'm talking about, and is certainly uh, one of the uh, difficulties. Now, how should we judge success uh, or not of the, uh, of the Troika programs? Uh, for those countries like Ireland, which are out, or for the countries that are not yet out, but that may be out uh, in a few months or uh, in a few years? What should be our criteria to do that? It seems to me uh, I, I can think of, of three different criteria. One is to see whether they've complied with loan conditionality. Okay? If they abided by the rules, by the conditions that were uh, present in the program themselves. Did they follow the conditionality? That's one way to judge success. A second one is to compare, uh, maybe a bit unfair, but natural way to expectation. The program, they did contain sort of projection to the future. One can look the odd turn compared to the expectations and see what happened. And another one, which I think it makes sense certainly as well, is to ability to regain market access. After all, countries had to get programmed because they had lost 
market access. And so one can say, well, if you regain market access, that is a sign that the program uh, has, been, uh, has been successful. So let me say a word on performance uh, along those three uh, criteria. If we look at compliance with conditionality, I would say that in all four program countries, and I'm including here Cyprus actually, not just Portugal, Greece, and, and, and Ireland, I would say that they are all more or less organized in the same manner. There are three blocks of conditionality. One is about fiscal consolidation. One is about financial sector reforms, because in all of those countries they were banking financial sector problems. And there are also, uh, in many of those programs, uh, growth enhancing measures, the structural measures. They're always organized in this manner, the conditionality. So if you look at how they respected the conditionality that had been uh, uh, included in the program, I would say on the whole, conditionality has been fairly well, uh, fairly well respected. Uh, certainly, um, uh, fiscal consolidation. Uh, fiscal consolidation has happened everywhere, everywhere. Um, including Greece, uh, certainly. If you look at financial sector reform, uh, I would say uh, financial sector reform has also been implemented, although we know there are still some problems, as I said, including in, including in Ireland. Uh, the more difficult one, in a sense, is the growth enhancing the structural reforms. Uh, now, the structural reforms, they're probably more important in some countries than in others. Uh, probably Ireland, uh, I think probably Cyprus as well, uh, they had fairly good structural conditions. Uh, competitive economies compared to Greece and, and Portugal, uh, but at the same time, uh, we know that those structural reforms, they take a long, long time to, to implement. I mean, those programs, they're three-year programs. Okay, Greece is a special case because there were two programs, but Ireland was, was a three-year program, Portugal is a three-year program, Cyprus is a three-year program, and uh, uh, Greece originally was a three-year program, but then they got uh, a second, uh, a second uh, program before the end of the, of, the, of the first one. So typically, they are three-year program. Now, how much structural reform can you do and get the, 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 the result uh, of that? I think that's a, a, difficult, uh, a difficult one. Criterion number two is to look at expectations uh, versus, uh, versus outcome. I think there, uh, there are certain patterns uh, that we see in the, uh, in the different countries. Uh, almost everywhere, uh, you had domestic demand uh, that fell uh, much more than, than expected. I mean, it was expected that domestic demand uh, would fall as a result of the, of the fiscal consolidation, uh, but it fell typically by more uh, than had been expected. We know there is this issue about elasticities, probably we did not, uh, that's hard to do, but the circumstances were such that probably the fiscal consolidation had more of, a, of an impact on domestic demand that we had anticipated. But then there were also the, fifth, the financial condition, including, obviously at some stage, the doubts about the perennity of, of the euro area. And that was certainly very hard on the, uh, on the crisis countries. And then there was, as I will show in, in a second, and, and you all know, sort of the, the unexpected double dip uh, recession in the euro area, sort of in, in, the, in the traditional markets of the, uh, of, of the, of the countries. The current accounts, uh, not the current account, but the current accounts, uh, they improve more than expected. And I think they improve more than expected for different reasons, partly because demand collapsed and import collapsed more than had been expected. Ireland is, 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 is a different uh, story here, but in all the other countries, certainly that. We had a collapse of demand and collapse of imports. And uh, in many cases, including in Ireland, including Portugal, but not in, uh, in, in Greece, exports did better than had been expected. So the current account... Uh, has moved in positive territory much faster than, than had been expected, partly for good reasons, partly for bad reasons. The bad reason is obviously the collapse of internal uh, demand. Unemployment, again, uh, with the exception of, of Ireland, uh, unemployment has risen much more than uh, had been expected in, in the program. And the public debt levels, with, again, the exception of Ireland. So Ireland, one sees there's a pattern here. Uh, Ireland is... Uh, a somewhat different case than, than others, the public debt increased much, much more than uh, had been expected. Uh, I'm showing here, and maybe difficult for you to, to read, uh, what I was showing here, um, but again, don't, don't try to read it and strain your eyes. I'm, I'm going to give you some numbers. It's first for Ireland, looking at the, what the programs had expected on some of the macro variables and what is the, uh, the outcome in uh, January. Uh, in January uh, 14, um, 
maybe just to, to, to remind you some numbers. For instance, if you look at uh, uh, GDP, the growth of GDP, the cumulated uh, uh, growth of GDP over the period, over the program period, uh, in the program, you, the, the expectation was 5.4% uh, real GDP, cumulated, not for one year, cumulated, um, and the outcome was le much less good, 1.5%. And domestic demand collapsed much more. So it was expected that the cumulated collapse of, of domestic demand would be 3.4% for Ireland, and the odd turn was 77 On the other hand, if you look at deficits, you know, uh, uh, Ireland is, is, is very much, uh, was very much on target. Uh, on terms of current account, it is better than was expected. In terms of unemployment, it's a bit higher, 13 and uh, 13 something, but it was expected 11.6, so the, 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 the odd turn is very close. And the, the government debt as well, the expectation was about 120%, and the, the odd turn was 124 now, if you look on the other hand at the other two countries that I'm considering here, Greece and Portugal, there the discrepancy between the expectation and the outturn is really uh, quite, quite uh, big. It's certainly quite big in terms of domestic demand. I mean, just to give you a number here, the collapse of domestic demand for, for Greece for that period was expected to be about 12%. Negative, it was 28%. Um, for, for Portugal, not so, not so bad. Uh, in terms of deficit, deficit's much, much bigger. Uh, the current account balance, like in Ireland, uh, better than had been ex 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 anticipated. So the current account, consistently in all countries, the outturn is better than expectation, but then unemployment, much, much worse. Um, uh, it had been expected uh, uh, an unemployment for, for the, about this time of the year in Greece, about 15%, it's 27 And for Portugal, the expectation was 12 and we are about 17%. Uh, and then the debt levels also far, far higher than uh, had been anticipated. So Ireland stands as a different case, certainly, than, than Portugal and Greece in terms of the uh, uh, the gap between expectation and outcome uh, for Ireland, it's not very far. The actual uh, outturn is more or less on target uh, compared to the, uh, to, to the expectation. For the other two countries, uh, the result is, is, is much, less, uh, much less good. Uh, double deep recession, we all, we all know about this. Uh, let me move then to criterion, sorry, criterion number three. Criterion number three is ability to regain uh, market access. Now, if you judge by that, you say, well, certainly uh, Ireland uh, has been successful. The Ireland was able to have market access and exit the, uh, the program on, on, those, on those grounds. If you look at Portugal, uh, Portugal, uh, whose program is due to expire the three-year program is due to expire in May uh, of this year. So it would have been three years in May. And now the question is, you know, will uh, Portugal be able to exit or not? The news have been good. And markets have uh, looked favorably at, at Portugal, and uh, Portugal has uh, regained uh, market access. Not has been able to issue at quite favorable conditions, although not as favorable at all as, as Ireland. So compared to where uh, Portugal was, was a year ago, uh, the, the situation is much better. So the, 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 the way markets are looking at, at Portugal is, uh, is much, much better. Remember also last summer there was a whole crisis in Portugal, some change of government. The finance minister who, who, uh, who left the government, all of those changes, so there were, they were a few months of, of difficulty. But it's for the moment, it's behind them, for the moment. Uh, so markets are certainly very, very favorable. Greece. Uh, I think one would agree that uh, they are still some way uh, from being able to have market access, nor do they need to have market access because the program uh, is covering their needs for, for, a little, for a little while. So in a sense, there's not that issue. And for Cyprus, I think that uh, there is, uh, it's too far down the line, it's less than a year since the program started in May of last year, and nobody's talking about uh, exiting. Now, Exiting from Troika programs, as I said, uh, Ireland has already exited, and uh, maybe we'll, we'll discuss that in, uh, in the question time. There was no, for good or bad, uh, we shall see, uh, there was no precautionary uh, credit, uh, credit line. I think 
I keep that for the, for the, for the, for the discussion. But I think what is interesting uh, now is to look at the next country down the line, which is, which is Portugal. And in principle, in principle, there are three choices for, for Portugal uh, when it will reach the end of the three-year program. Either it will have a clean exit, like, uh, like uh, Ireland, uh, an exit and nothing, and no precautionary program, or there will be an exit but a, a precautionary or but or with a, a precautionary credit line to, to ensure that uh, uh, it would resist uh, in case there was some uh, change in, in market sentiment. Or one could say, well, you know, looking down the line, uh, it's much too fragile a situation. Uh, Portugal really needs a, 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 a new program. Now, I should say for, for, for Portugal, um, six months ago, the discussion uh, among officials, as far as I, I, I can tell, was really between option two and option three. It was either a new program or exit with precautionary. Uh, because of the much improvement in market sentiment, including the island effect. So island certainly had the effect in itself, both I think on the politics and also on the mood uh, of markets. Uh, the, the, the third option has disappeared entirely. Sort of the new program is just not there at all. So now the real choice, uh, both for the uh, Portuguese authorities and for their partners in the euro area, where, is whether it will be a clean exit a la, uh, a la island or this intermediate uh, situation, uh, exit with a precautionary, and I will say something in a second. Um, for Greece, uh, that has now the second program since March 2012. So the first program was in May 2010. The first program was sort of terminated early and a new program was put into place in March 2012. And that second program runs out in December of, uh, of this year. So there will be an issue in, in, in Greece as well. What next? A clean exit. I think nobody's talking about that. Uh, I think uh, even a, an exit with the precautionary uh, seems... Uh, uh, unreasonable, so probably one is going for a third, uh, third, hopefully a final program, and uh, for Cyprus, much too early to, to discuss the, the situation. Now, the point I want to make is the uh, following. Criterion number three for judging success, that is exiting the program, uh, is clearly in the policy world. And in the political world and in the world of policymakers, the way one has chosen to discuss success of the program. That is, one is exiting, and exiting is the proof that indeed the program has been successful. And in a sense, as I indicate, it's, it's understandable. I mean, it's, the euro area needs also, and countries also need to have some successes, and uh, uh, much effort has been undertaken into respecting the, uh, the conditionality. And to be able to claim victory, that those efforts have borne fruits and uh, exit is the proof that all these efforts that have been done uh, have, uh, have uh, uh, borne the, uh, the hoped fruit and, and the markets are also looking favorably at the countries, I think is quite understandable. Uh, my view is that we as economists, we should resist this temptation of uh, policymakers and maybe worse, of politicians, sort of to look in this narrow uh, in this narrow sense. It seems to me what we need to do is to look at the long-term sustainability, not simply look at short-term market sentiment, because we should have learned that short-term market sentiment can be good today and can be bad tomorrow. So we should be a little bit more careful. And I think what we don't want to have is a situation where countries are exiting and would have to re-enter uh, a program uh, in, uh, in some months. Now, uh, I think my sense is that if I, I look at the situation today compared to where we were in 2009, before the, the, the programs, some imbalances clearly have sharply decreased. Uh, I'm giving here numbers, and again, there's no need to, to, you probably can't see them, but certainly in terms of deficit, public deficit, in terms of current account balance, as I've already indicated several times, uh, the situation is much improved. So there, if we look at the, uh, the imbalance, and we have an imbalance procedure at the EU level, all of those things, the imbalances, the flow into the imbalances, uh, they have improved uh, markedly since uh, 2009. Now, on the other hand, first, if you look at unemployment, unemployment levels, with the exception 
uh, of Ireland, uh, the unemployment levels, they are very, very high, 27% uh, in Greece, 17% in Portugal. Uh, Ireland, not that it's a low number, but again, it's a number of a more manageable nature, and one, this is more in line with the expectation. It's also important what were the, the expectations. So it's 13% compared to 12%, so we are clearly in the... Uh, and it's, it's started to come down, uh, and that's all, uh, that's all good news. Now, I think where the not so good news is that we have to take into account is the debt levels. And debt levels, I'm showing numbers here, not only on public debt level, but also private debt level and external, uh, external debt. So there, if you look at the situation for Greece, Portugal, and, and Ireland, actually, and you look at the situation in 2013, so the end 2013, uh, the last uh, figures, compared to 2009, there, uh, things are not so well. So if you look in flows, if you look at imbalances, if you look even at unemployment, you get a picture. If you look at debt, all of this accumulation of, of problems, we have not yet disaccumulated. We have managed to stem the, 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 the flow and stem the, the, the problem, but we have not yet managed to, to, to decrease. Uh, even, obviously, for Ireland, the debt today is double the debt of 2009, the public debt. Uh, the net international investment position is, has worsened since 2009, and the private debt level, uh, which was, as we know, Ireland's uh, record, uh, record holder, uh, was very bad in, in, uh, in 2009. It's not improved at all since then. It's even deteriorated a, a little bit. And that situation is more or less on par for, for Greece and, and for Portugal. So if you look from this angle, then you, s you start to get a bit worried uh, that, yes, you know, efforts have been made on the fiscal side. Yes, the current account deficit uh, have turned into, uh, into positive. So certainly there's been a change there, but what has been accumulated, let's say, the debt overhang. This is what we are talking about here. The debt overhang, it's there. The public debt, the private debt, and the external debt, they are there. Now, on that basis, we, with uh, my two colleagues uh, at Bruegel, we decided to do a debt sustainability analysis. Now, everybody has their own debt sustainability analysis. We are not the only ones to do that. The IMF does that. The, the Commission does that. I'm sure uh, the, uh, uh, the Irish Finance Ministry does its own debt sustainability, and that's, that's quite normal. This is the public debt. So we did our debt sustainability analysis for the three countries, and we are looking up to 2030. Now, in the debt sustainability analysis, you have to make assumptions. And you know, the analysis is as good as the assumptions, obviously, that, that you make. In our baseline scenario, uh, we make assumptions for nominal GDP, for nominal interest rate, and primary surplus. For nominal GDP, up to 2018, we take the official forecasts. From 2022, we assume in the baseline scenario for all three countries a nominal GDP growth of 3.7% a year. Now, one can discuss whether it's too low, too high, but this is the figure. We take 37 which is actually what you get in consensus economics for Spain. They don't have numbers for Ireland, for Greece, or for Portugal, but they have Spain. And we said, okay, let's take that as a reasonable number for nominal GDP growth from 2022. And then you have the adjustment from 2018 to that. For the nominal interest rate, uh, we take uh, some figures for, for, for the Bund, rising to 2.8% by 2020 and 3.3% 3 .3 by 2030. And then we look at spreads over Bund for Ireland, the lowest, 100 basis points only. Uh, for Portugal, 150, quite low. And for Greece, from 2022, 200 basis points. So much improved from today. And then for the primary surplus, again, we look at official uh, figures up to 2018. And after that, we looked at a number of, of a study published last year by the IMF where they looked at successful consolidation, of which Ireland in the past is certainly one of the cases, my country, Belgium, as well. And there you see that the average primary surplus for countries that had successful consolidation is 3.1% primary surplus year after year. And this is the figure we use. Okay? As as uh, sort of a baseline saying, OK, all the countries are committed to fiscal consolidation. And this is uh, quite a demanding. For Ireland, histo by historical uh, standards, it's not so demanding. Ireland has been able to do better than that. For Greece and Portugal, 
uh, that's something unheard of. So, you know, it's someplace uh, in, in, in between. Now, when we do our analysis, um, and again, you, you, you can't see the, the details, but I just want to show you two. In those graphs, we do one per country. This is for Ireland. So what you have here, this line here, this blue line here at the bottom, so this is the debt to GDP. Debt to GDP, uh, starting in 2010, you reach sort of the, 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 the summit here, uh, about <coughs> 2013, uh, 125%. In the baseline scenario, there is a gentle decline of the debt, and by 2030, uh, we get to about 75% uh, of GDP debt. So if all goes well, so if the baseline scenario materializes, then uh, certainly no problem of sustainability. Now, if there starts to be a problem, uh, uh, GDP growth is not as high as expected, interest rate is, is higher, you are not managing to have the primary surplus that we assume, and uh, a number of uh, those uh, issues, um, then you start to move there, and if all of those bad scenarios that we consider materialize, then the part is the part here in, in, in pink at, at, at the top. Uh, the debt is not declining, but uh, it's not exploding either. So in this worst case scenario that, that we look at, so the worst case in terms of GDP, in terms of interest rates, in terms of primary surplus, and also something about bank recapitalization, uh, the debt level that Ireland has reached now will sort of remain more or less there. So there's not a debt explosion. I mean, it's not, uh, it's not great, but it's not, uh, it's not either a uh, horrendous, uh, horrendous case. Portugal is a less uh, good situation. Again, if all goes well, uh, gentle decline from now. And uh, uh, Portugal is more or less the debt to GDP level that the uh, island has, about 125%. So you, you, the starting point is roughly the same. But if the bad scenario materializes, we probably higher probability for Portugal than for uh, Ireland, given the past uh, in terms of ability to have primary surplus, in terms of the, the, the fundamentals of the economy and the structural level. So there's more chance there. You start to get into less uh, pretty picture with the debt rising, not simply staying flat, but rising and reaching, uh, by the end of the period, 155%. Uh, and the last case is, 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 is Greece, which, again, if all goes well, uh, Greece uh, by 2030 is below 100% of, uh, of, uh, of GDP in the debt. So, I mean, there is a possibility. We already incorporate here in the Greek scenario a number of, of debt reduction that are already in, in the pipeline. Uh, but otherwise, there could be, uh, there could be much, more, uh, much more problem. Now, let me... Uh, conclude, uh, I have two more slides and then I, I will have finished, uh, the implication that we draw from our analysis, both sort of the informal analysis and the analysis in terms of, of the debt sustainability, is that looking forward, so I'm not commenting on, on Ireland, again, keep that for the discussion, uh, our view is that Portugal uh, should not opt for a clean exit. Uh, again, uh, we know very well what is the politics, both the politics in, in uh, Portugal and the politics in some of the euro area partners that favor very much having a clean exit, sort of a second clean exit. We feel that the Portuguese situation is not the uh, Irish situation. Again, one can go back and discuss whether it was wise for Ireland to have uh, a, an exit without a precautionary uh, credit line, but we feel that certainly for, for Portugal, that would not be wise, neither for Portugal nor for the euro area as a whole, and therefore we encourage the choice to be made, which is not debated, to go for the uh, precautionary credit line rather than to go for the clean exit. For Greece, uh, we advocate, and we have already indicated actually in, in our calculation, what kind of third program one needs. It's not a very large third program, but one needs another 40, uh, 40 billion uh, euros, and then Port uh, Greece would be able to uh, not have uh, need market access for the next 20 years, and you know, hopefully can continue its reform, but being shielded by the uh, the program, not being under the, the constant pressure. And Cyprus, I mean, we don't really know, we didn't really calculate, but our impression is that it's probably more in the Irish 
camp than in, in the Greek camp. That's all uh, we can say, uh, although uh, we view that the removal that needs to be done, the government has announced this year, we shall see, about the removal of the capital controls. It's a challenge. Uh, we have seen from, uh, from Iceland that once you have capital controls, it's tough to remove. Uh, how it will happen and what will be the implication, we don't know. But we feel that the, uh, the Cyprus economy uh, has some uh, strength in its uh, structural side that uh, we are more optimistic feeling that you know, it can be, it could be at a time uh, a repeat of the, Irish, of the Irish case. So the last slide is, you know, uh, beyond uh, the Troika programs. So I think the message we want to, to give, and I certainly want to give, is that uh, one needs to consider issues beyond exit. So exit is not the end of, 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 of problems. Again, because huge amount of debt accumulation has occurred. Uh, public debt, private debt, uh, external debt. So all of those imbalances that had built up, uh, they are still there. So not in terms of the flow, there is much improvement, but the, the debt overhang, it's there, and it's certainly giving fragility to, 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 the, uh, to the economy. So we feel that debt sustainability is not guaranteed. So don't look at this problem in a short-term perspective. Have a longer-term perspective. Uh, second point, uh, don't only look, obviously, at the numerator of the debt to GDP, also look at the denominator. Uh, and the denominator here is not simply real uh, GDP growth, it's also uh, inflation. So it's nominal GDP growth, this is what matters. And yes, uh, one needs higher nominal GDP growth. And when I mean nominal GDP growth, uh, I also mean uh, inflation. I don't only mean uh, growth. We certainly need higher uh, growth, uh, but um, if we could have a bit more inflation, that would be uh, helpful uh, as well. Uh, point three, um, adjustment uh, would certainly be easier if we had a more uh, symmetric uh, situation. So if the burden of the adjustment was not only carried by the, uh, by the deficit countries, and we saw that there is this very sharp uh, uh, reduction of the current account deficit. Actually, the current account deficit for all countries, including for Greece now, is turning positive. So it, it, is, it has gone very fast. So for countries that do not have the exchange rate instrument, uh, the adjustment has, has taken place very fast. But as I indicated before, the adjustment doesn't only come from the export and the improvement of competitiveness. It comes also from the collapse, in some cases, of imports and the collapse of internal demand. And that's the less, obviously, positive side of this. Um, point four, well, uh, if downside risks do materialize, um, so this is our baseline scenario, and a baseline scenario say, you know, uh, uh, that sustainability may be possible, but it's not guaranteed. What to do? I think there is room in the, uh, in the arrangements that will last for a long time, because those loans, those ESM loans, those EFSF loans, uh, they are loans for a long period of time, there is uh, some room for reduction of loan charges of the interest rates and the lengthening of loan maturities. That has already taken place. Both the lengthening of, uh, of maturities, including in Ireland, and uh, the uh, lowering of the charges they have taken place, there is still room. Uh, now, how much room there is and at what stage it becomes a debt restructuring, obviously this is a, this is a discussion. And finally, uh, there's going to be post-program surveillance. Now, post-program surveillance, we really don't know what it will mean. Um, post-program surveillance is not simply uh, in the Troika program. The IMF always had post-program surveillance. But you remember that the ESM uh, treaty, and especially the Tupac legislation, indicates that you remain under post-program surveillance as long as uh, you have not reimbursed 70% of your EFSF uh, ESM loans. So if you look at Ireland, if you look at Portugal, if you look at Greece, one is talking well beyond one decade, sometimes two, sometimes even three decades, before 70% of those uh, European loans will have been reimbursed. In the meantime, we will have post-program surveillance. What post-program surveillance will mean, we shall see how it will bite, but I think one in a sense, in from, view, from my viewpoint, it's a good element. It's an element that reminds us that, indeed, this is for the long haul. Let me stop here. Thank you.